Oh, it's so nice of you to meet, like the pair of you. It's really lovely. Yeah, no, thanks for introducing us. Yeah, pieces of work that you sent for to ha you know for us to include in the project. You know, prints of. It's just amazing. Thank you. So I don't know if you want to well, start talking a little bit more about them. I, I just wanted to say, Caroline, that last night I watched the uh, YouTube of you giving some hints about how to do a collage. And I thought it was really wonderful. So I wanted to learn more uh, kind of about what you did. So it was really, really interesting and well done. So I appreciated that. Thanks. If people don't want to send something creative to themselves or they don't feel they can be creative, um, either I can do something with the things they're sending me, but obviously it's really lovely to get pieces that people have done or their children have done for them or family members. So, but I understand that not everyone feels creative or it's, you know, it's, maybe easier to hand something very personal over also to someone else than to do something with it. Yeah. I don't know yeah. your feelings, yeah. You know, um, I'm feeling uh, the benefits of interacting, whether you are gathering stuff. Yeah. I'm thinking about it or doing it. It's very healing, actually, to go to those material things and uh, connect with the memories, you know. Definitely. Have you done that for a long time, responding to your story, or is it more recent? You know, Caroline, I'm, uh, I was born in 1932, so it's kind of a really long story. And uh, for many, many years, uh, I did not want to think about it. You know, it was kind of a closed door. I think uh, doing this has been part of my healing process over the last few years. And I'm very um, convinced that this kind of thing uh, is very helpful because rather than just the spoken word, uh, to engage in kind of the objects and the symbols I think has been very uh, healing for me. I think the whole thing with making collages started off when a friend of mine um, went to a workshop. Um, she was doing a course on counseling and the use of art therapy. And I went to the workshop, and this must be maybe 20 years ago. Uh, I was somewhat intimidated because they were all uh, students, you know, doing their degrees, but I also wasn't really ready in a group to kind of expose my history. So I remember I went to the um, workshop and we were given the choice, we could choose anything, and the lecturer provided the materials. And I had just arrived in Arizona and I did a collage on what it was like to live in the heat of Arizona, which was some um, kind of really not dealing with what was really yeah. issues, you know, avoidance. But it kind of opened the door and um, I continued to do it on my own and I started to engage. And the first uh, collage that really uh, came together, I tried one or two, was this one, I don't know if you um, remember it, Alone. You know, yes, the one on, yeah, the very, yeah, you're in the corner, yeah. And in that one, I really returned to um, my experience as a child in England. And I was actually, I went back, into the little bedroom that I was given. It was a very cold, a bare room. And I delved into my feeling uh, of being alone and uh, bereft. It was very good to kind of go back and face that time. But I don't know if you noticed there was the clouds in the sky and there was mm -hmm. kind of this gold thread that wove into my little box. And the box was very painful. I actually got a picture of a, um, a, a kind of giant cone and cut it so that there were sharp points going into the box. And that represented uh, 
kind of beating on my heart, the pain of it all. And then there was this gold thread, which I didn't see. I was sitting against the wall, scrunched up, and it was behind me. And looking back from the vantage point of all those years, I could see that behind me was my heavenly father. I wasn't actually alone, although it felt like it. So there was a lot of depth in that, and it was like a big breakthrough in me facing the past, you know. You know, the symbolism behind it, that, you know, thinking back to the the room where you where you were as a child but then not feeling alone and and also but also feeling alone at the same time and reflecting back on that childhood state and those experiences as an adult as well and how that materializes into a collage is really interesting yeah yeah i think it's um an expression of loss you know and i think this is the common emotion of um uh, kinder transport survivors is the loss and you know uh, the whole um, generally speaking I would think that uh, a lot of the kinder transport children experience this intense love of the parents and you know I've listened to testimonies and I can echo that you know that you were uh, this um, deeply loved child and you were bereft. And so um, I think that's the common experience of the kinder transport. And today, you know, children who are separated from their parents, it's a, it's, um, it's a very big deal. And, uh, you know, when I look at that collage, I can identify with um, other children refugees have you ever done any work sort of from your parents point of view or is that really too painful no i think that would be a very very good thing to do i, I mean that's actually an... the educational understanding of many people that don't know about the kind of transport and obviously that's part of what it's was all positive and you know being safe but people don't seem to think about the role the parents took or the grandparent or whoever of putting you or doing that decision of you know, giving you, as someone put in one of their quotes in the, you know, giving them life twice by, um, so I'd be really interested if people have ever done anything in relation to. I have gone into the, um, my parents' uh, experience, not intensely deeply, but you know, I wrote my story and it was published. And a part of that story is I'm really, uh, a kind of entry into their experience, not only um, the pain of losing their only child this way, but I was trying to enter emotionally into what they experienced after I left. So well, I did exactly. a lot of research, you know, into what the laws were and what happened in Cologne and all that. So I wrote about it. And I also retrace their steps to uh, Chumno, where they were gassed, and actually went there. And so in one sense, I tried to enter in that way, but I've mm -hmm. never done a collage on it, you know. No, I, I, I could totally understand that the journey alone, but it'd be interesting, do you think you ever would now, or...? the writing was enough or the journeying itself? Well, I have not done a collage for a long time because um, most of my expression is through writing, you know. And um, so I've kind of focused on that. So the, the collage has been a very vital part of my healing process, the different collages. But it's almost like I've been released uh, to give words to describe it. I, I think, um, especially the idea of collage, where you don't have to be a great artist to mm -hmm. do it. You know, you don't have to have a lot of skill. But if you have all these materials, uh, colors, textures, and you can convey so much in that, and then you don't 
have to be always so precise, you can tear it and everything. That's a great release. And for me, it was like a step onto uh, being free to really um, think deeply about it and then to express it in words. And so I've written about it and spoken about it. You know. Yeah, what perspective are you approaching your artistic release from? You know, it's interesting that you know, you focused that particular collage on um, a particular room in England, you know, um, and your question, Caroline, about doing the collage is from a different perspective. It's really interesting to pick up on what part of the story is a healing process in terms of what you were then represent in a collage. It was interesting that you went to that moment of arrival and and really delve deep into your emotions like you know that first couple of moments in Britain and going to that childhood room in a different country like you'd had a a room in a in a total different circumstance in a total other country in a different house with different people um I don't know Hannah if you want to speak about the differences between that collage and the the second collage yeah, I think that is a good uh, progression because um, I think it links in more with um, Caroline's question about my parents' point of view. Although I approach the second collage uh, very much again from me, you know, me sent, but uh, the circumstances of doing that later collage. Uh, was quite extraordinary for me. Um, I think I shared that, but it might be good to put the background for Carolyn. Um, you know, my um, home, my first home, was in the Eiffel part of Germany, which is like um, a region to the west of Cologne, and it's very uh, rural, and it's somewhat poor, and uh, there are small towns and villages ringed by the cities like Cologne on the east, uh, Trier, Trier on the south, Aachen on the west. So it's enclosed. And um, I spent the first seven years there, and the second collage is extraordinary because it was also a huge deal in my healing and it took place actually in the Eiffel in a small village um, maybe uh, 30 kilometers from where I um, lived my first seven years. I came to know a woman called Maria who was a retired art teacher and she decided to invite some of her friends, women, there were about six of us, to her home. And she had a beautiful home, which was full of light. And um, she had this big room with lovely wooden um, floor, and she covered it with newspapers. And she had a huge supply of materials. She had paints, brushes, papers, um, tons of uh, artistic calendars. So we had lots to choose from. And she uh, had a day seminar uh, of friends. And we um, had this lovely, quiet environment where we were free to do what we wanted. And so that, that my second collage that I said uh, came out of that. And um, it was actually to do uh, with, uh, again, the parting with my parents, the actual parting. And so there's a lot of um, kind of disturbance in the picture. And the shapes, a lot of them are violent. And the texture, like there's corrugated cardboard and pictures of dead weeds, which uh, represent uh, the chaos and the pain of parting. But um, it also continues into my life. Um, there are, it, it starts to lighten up and there are flowers and everything. 
So uh, that was a huge deal for me because it took place so near to where I lived with my parents and the place of uh, both love and pain. And again, uh, that contributed to the healing nature of it, you know. I think it's really interesting the what you were saying just about the proximity and, and where you are and the time of your life where you're when you're doing these collages, you know, one in America, one in Germany, it kind of really bookends both of your, you know, that journey, do you know what I mean? But it also shows that the circular nature of your journey, you know, it's not yes. a movement from one place to another, it's then that return process as well. I think it's also, I, I really feel that's very significant what you're saying, Amy. Uh, it's really true. And the other aspect is of the place of Germany and Germans in my healing. Mm. You know, I'm still um, in contact with Maria. And um, when we started on the journey to follow my parents' steps, there's a place in Cologne called Muggersdorf, and it's like a park area now. And it was part of, um, the, there was a, a fort at one time around Cologne, and there were some remnants of that in this area. And that's where uh, the Jews were rounded up before being shipped off to Chamno and other places. And um, we went there as a group, and Maria was one of those who went there with us. And there was a man from Cologne who was a retired um, head of the criminal police. And he discovered uh, during his uh, work there, the complicity of the police with the, um, the Nazi regime. And he was heartbroken. I mean, this, his job was his life and somehow the whole bottom dropped out. And he um, spent the years of his retirement uh, taking tours around Cologne uh, showing areas uh, to do with what had happened to the Jews, sort of like he wanted to do something about it. And uh, we got to meet him and he actually um, researched and gave us this information where the Jews had gone and he took us there and was with us and Maria was with us. And there's a little plaque that says what this place was. And we have a photograph of, of us standing together. So I'm just saying uh, what is very wonderful to me is the role of Germans in the healing process and in the um, remembrance, you know. So Maria was a significant person and she was the one who did the setting for this collage. So I think you know, a uh, thing that comes to me is it's very important for the kinder and their children to have an environment of permission and encouragement to do what they're doing. So I think what you're doing is really great, Carolyn, in, in the way that you are uh, providing this, you know. Thank you. Do you think you would do some more art at any point? Well, I'm also very engaged in taking photographs, you know, I'm really, uh, you know, what's the way to communicate widely the story, you know, I really feel that we're living in such strange times that it's kind of important to tell these things. And um, I'm really loving what Amy's doing because I think it has a wider implication than the Holocaust. And so, you know, I'm thinking about media, like, and I'm only into Instagram and doing photographs. And not only, like I just posted this other um, sort of collage that I did 
as a way of communicating, you know, how to uh, treat other people, you know, and the effects of wrongs on people. So I'm not sure. I mean, your question makes me start to think, should I do this? You know, but, <laughs> but I just think like now I'm starting to get some student responses, which I think is amazing. And, and it's definitely one way of educating through art and images and, you know, as well as storytelling. So, and, and it's the means that if you're not very good at writing or not academic or find it hard to concentrate, then images, I think, speak to some people that learn visually. And, and as you say, it's, it's a very, we're in a very visual world at the moment, social media. So um, it is a way of immediately responding, I think. You know, um, I think all that is so true. And I also think uh, this way of doing collages uh, has implications for our own personal hurts, you know, because um, people carry a lot of burdens. You know, there are breakups in families and um, there are groups that are, have received abuse you know, p people have a lot of stuff they're carrying and where do they go with it? And so I uh, feel that telling the story through collage is a means for them to, um, to really find uh, some answers, you know. But it's interesting as well, you know, it's not just, it's the, how many effects that can then have you know it's not just Hannah you've done the collage you're also then posting about the collage so the collage is has that physical nature to it but then it also has this digital and immediate communication where you're able to share share it again in a, in a new dimension and have new responses to it I also wondered about um, each time that you've been doing these collages, material has been kind of provided and would you have done it differently if you were picking your own, I know you're picking your own material and that there is a well to pick from, but do you think you may have done it differently or similarly if that material wasn't provided? Um, I think that's a really good question and um, I definitely feel uh, a wide variety of material um, gives uh, a lot of meaning and depth to the result. Um, I, I'm also, you know, I, I can go two ways. I just want to say that looking at uh, Karen's uh, YouTube made me realize, because you see, one of the things um, for me in the question of making a collage of the things that you still have, you know, that was very um, deep value to me to see like that handkerchief, the picture of that handkerchief on um, Carolyn's uh, collection for this person. Because you see, I have lost the, the very a few meager uh, resources that were given to me by my parents. They haven't stayed with me. You know, I had very little when I left in the sense of photographs or documents. In fact, I had no picture of my parents. So the only pictures that I have of my parents and of myself as a child were given to me by other survivors that my mother had given these two. So they did this long journey from my mother to the survivor in Israel who gave it to me. And so, um, you know, seeing those things that Caroline had collected also put me in touch with what I'd lost. You know, my parents sent me with lots and lots of clothes and also my dolls. I had a box of dolls, believe it or not, and the dolls were dressed in my baby clothes. Oh and no. Yes, and in the box were folded up my other baby clothes so that the dolls had changes of clothes. Can you imagine? No, and I can't. All that, all that has gone, 
all that is gone. So, you know, I got to thinking about um, how do you uh, remember those things? Because I think it really affects you when you lose that. And, you know, I came to think it would be good, actually, to kind of write a poem about it. I have reached the stage where I find it's important not to leave things buried. You know, mm -hmm. you can bring them up to the light for healing. There's healing in the light. I wonder if those other kinder with the little things that they had that are treasures, did they also lose other things, other. you know? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Because I often wonder when I look at, um, with students, objects that, you know, people have donated now to museums, and you just think, I know that, you know, I, would you not give it up afterwards to give it up now before, you know, some have been there for quite a long time. And I don't know how you would do that as well if you had that precious item with a knitted thing on or a beloved dog with its worn. And I wouldn't let it go myself, but then I, that's, I don't know. So I think there's so much embedded in an object. Yeah. So to yeah. lose that object again, twice maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, we've gone off at a tangent totally, but that was going to happen. I can't remember the original question now, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Amy, what was the original what question? What was the original you're making? <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's wonderful to hear, to hear the, this side as well. No, the, the, the question was really if the, um, both times the, the material was... was oh, yes, the materials, yeah. Yeah. I a just, range of materials given or yeah. chosen, yeah. Yeah, I just would wanted you have to chosen different. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, you know, um, having all that material was like a launching. It um, allowed you to experience um, this art medium uh, in great freedom, and it gave confidence as well as. Um, kind of helped you the, the massive material helped me to engage with what happened and how I felt about it well how was that experience but you know um having experienced that quite deeply I think it gave me confidence and uh I also um had the experience of having to choose materials and being very limited in what you could um, uh, choose. You know, I don't know if Caroline has seen this um, posting that I did of, uh, it's, it's a type of collage. I was studying color and um, the lecturer gave us a very constricted consignment. Uh, we had to buy ourselves uh, one of these vast uh, thick books of various colours with very slight differences and we had to select from there and we had to select a certain number and it had to be contained in a square of a certain size and each square had to be a certain size and you were not allowed to do more than once. And then each color that you chose had to be different from the other. And this was a, a very different kind of way of working because you were very constrained and very responsible. Mm -hmm. But um, she got us to engage with the emotion of color. And so we explored our emotions through color. And we were told that we had to choose an event in our life that really happened that was either very sad or very happy. It had to be intensely emotional and we were not allowed to tell what the event was. And after the, we had uh, produced our pieces, they were all pinned to the wall and the whole class had to go to each piece and discuss it and decide what we thought the event was about and it was the most amazing experience to find that in a general way people 
could say what had happened. For instance, with mine, they said this was an event in your childhood and it was very, very bad. So um, that was really true. And so, you know, uh, this links, I think, to your question uh, about the availability of materials influencing you. I do think there can be a progression after you have engaged with um, a wide variety of materials to be, you know, Jeez, and yeah. precise. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes having a, a constraint just focuses you more so perhaps and and what better thing than color yes or not color yes so a lot a lot of uh, work when i look at survivors work that maybe weren't an artist before the holocaust but have later expressed i'm thinking of one raymond sinter lady um cj stoker and her work begins family life it's beautiful colors it's bright mamas in a pink dress true to them they say they take away our a cloth of colour and they're in the prison uniform in camps, Auschwitz, it's black and white and then life after there's colour but it's never the same colour for the family members and she's got the symbol of a bird that eventually is grey but it's black most of the time you know so there's, I think colour is such a powerful and the students don't even need to be able to speak, they can visually see you know the colour literally draining out of her journey yes. and then back in a little um, yeah. and it's very powerful share with Caroline um, what you've then done with your collages and their kind of afterlife beyond you making them and you know displaying them what happens the only um, I don't no longer have that collage the middle one the one uh, where I made an eyeful and that's kind of um, links very much with this whole thing of um, things and uh, memories and the, you know, my losses uh, have made me kind of cling on to things quite a bit. You know, it's very hard to throw things away, I find, uh, which is actually quite a hindrance you know, in many ways. But I, you know, I think it was those losses that make you cling to material things. So this was a really big deal that um, I actually gave that collage away. Um, it was made in the Eiffel and we had an apartment uh, in a tiny village called Darlam and uh, it hung on our wall in Durham and um, I actually thought how on earth will I get this to America because you know I think it would damage it because you know it was, it was, a, there was, it was not a flat surface there was a lot of you know things stuck on it anyway but it was it was very significant to me and, you know, people would come and look at it and it was so dramatic, you know, and I had an artist friend who came and she said, oh, this is quite wonderful, you know, and all that. So uh, I kind of brushed that off, but I really felt, wow, you know, I, this is very special. Well, I had an experience um, in Bonn where in a very public way, uh, a man whose grandfather had been a Nazi who um, had been stationed in Chumno where my parents died and he was stationed there at the date that they died and uh, he knew this because um, in this public event I read from my book um, describing what happened to them in Chumna. And uh, he publicly asked forgiveness. He himself had done a lot of uh, sorrowing about his family history, but he felt, um, he said he wanted to say to me the words that his grandfather never said, 
because he was a Nazi till the day he died in his 90s. And he said, I want to ask you the words he never said for me, will you forgive me? And that was a moment where I didn't actually um, have to sit and think, should I do this or not? It was almost like I was compelled to do it, to forgive him. And that began a relationship with him and his wife. And uh, they came, both of them, to visit us. And we took them around our apartment. And as we were standing looking at the picture, I um, had the sense, um, I am to give this to, Mar to Marcus. And, you know, knowing my story and my um, kind of connection to material things, this was quite a big deal. And, but I did it. And I, I think it kind of sealed something for him and for me. You know, I, I think uh, there is a huge need to, um, reconcile with the past and for me i can see that that was the spot you know to give this up to him um i think that was very freeing for me and it was also a ceiling of freeing for him thank you for sharing that makes total sense Thank you. And it must have been so powerful for him and to, to have it. Yes. And to have, you know, your personal forgiveness. Yes. And um, it was something almost like you would say, uh, it was like a miracle. It wasn't the normal, you know. And no, the was, timing and everything, yeah, was meant yeah. to be. So, in, like, you know, in Yiddish, that's Bashat, it's meant to be, yeah. Yes, yes. And, you know, um, the date we had, the, um, he asked me to forgive, uh, was the date my parents died. No, 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 don't. Just got goosebumps. Yeah, and that's why I read that part of the book. I wonder, Hannah, if you could... Um, tell us what happened to the other two collages and where they are. Okay. Well, the one alone is in a filing cabinet in this room. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the back, back in the box. <laughs> yes, yes. And the other one is hanging up in our um, kitchen. It, you know, I took a picture and it was very difficult because it's under glass. And, you know, I mentioned that one of the squares was a little bit off because, you know, it's really old now and it's, um, the glue's kind of getting old, you know. Yeah. But it's still in the frame and, you know, there it is hanging on the wall, you know. So the, that other one is the only one that's left the mess. Right, so I don't think I've seen, or is that the one, all coloured squares, the one yes. that's framed? All oh, right, so yeah, I have just seen that one then, yeah. That's so, on the that the, Yeah, I just saw that. Is that the last one of the ones you made of, the, of those three then? What was the order? Alone was first? Alone was first, the squares was next. Second. And then the last one was the one I gave away. And, you know, something very interesting, uh, the, the whole connection between art and collage and writing, I think, you know, and this is a new thought now as we're talking, it's coming to me, it's very stimulating talking to you. Um, I think doing the work on the collage released me to write the story because I put into words feelings 
and I it, it, it impelled me to research to find facts so the book is um, facts and research and objective uh, thinking but it's also very subjective how did I feel at that time and so I see doing collages also as a step in um, in wholeness you know in dealing with the past it's some um, it's part of a, 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 um, a whole journey you know definitely um, from all all the, the work i've seen you know drawing from after the holocaust definitely is um the lady i mentioned she also wrote as well in poems so i think maybe creativity is across, it doesn't just have to be one or the other. And for some people it would be one or the other. Yeah. But in a lot of her paintings, there's words written as well. And, you know, it's very interesting. I don't know if there is a divide or it can just be together or like you say, one feeds the other. Yeah. Or allows the other. You know, I think with anything artistic, it's almost like there's a crisis of confidence. You have to feel this release to do it. Now, if you're a, a child who has been um, parented or taught uh, to have confidence in these things and that your capacity for it, I think uh, that's much easier. But if you're not, if you, uh, because you know, I, my first school in England, it was very Victorian. <laughs> and those early days, you were not allowed freedom in art. And you imbibe that. So it's almost like you have to undo. Uh, the damage. <laughs> yes, yes. So I think we're all so different. But it's like, um, once you've tried one thing, you, you, it's, it's easier to try another, I think. But yeah, in terms of your writing, Hannah, you know, that's, writing can be a, an a artistic release as well. And you mentioned a poem um, back in the conversation a little bit, a while ago. Do, have you, do you think you'll write poetry or do you think you'll continue to write um, uh, in, a, in a different context? Like it's interesting how you, present your story through Instagram with like the visual representation, but then also the, the, how beautifully you were things as well. I don't know if you want to speak about that type of aspect as well, because that's putting your story out there in a really creative and interesting way as well. Um, yeah, you know, um, I think one of the things that crossed my mind, I don't know if it'll happen, but looking at the work that Carolyn did uh, made me think, you know, what I was saying about the things I had lost. Uh, for instance, one um, item that I did bring with me was a little tiny heart-shaped red um, purse. You know, it's a little uh, coin purse. It was very small and it has a zip on the top. And it was this pebbly kind of red leather. And I bought that with me, but it was lost. Actually, it was lost in Belgium, but that's a whole other story. But what made me think about, um, I thought, you know, maybe one way to deal with it, I don't have a picture, I don't have the item. One way to kind of restore it would be to write a poem about it you know, describing. Mm. So that was something that came to my mind after watching uh, what she had done with uh, other people's memories, you know, and material things. So um, I don't have kind of a plan in mind, but I'm kind of open to whatever happens. And there's um, something almost in writing um, you're almost driven to do it. You know, you get this idea and it's like a dog with a bone. You can't put it down. You know, you keep 
thinking about it and then you write it and then you chop off the words that don't matter you know and then you look at it for is this really true am i just writing words for the sound of it you know but um, oh and i think that would be a lovely idea i think that would yeah. and would that help you i'm not saying you haven't come to terms but would that help you uh you know come to terms with you know the lost it i, I can already feel it when you said it was like you know um you know like the leather of it or the feel of it so how could you maybe describe that and i don't know it's just that connection again isn't it to childhood you know yes yes and, 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 every, and every, everyone could connect because everyone's whether it's a wallet or a purse we've all got some means of carry you know carrying money or and that yeah. first little, your own little thing, your first time. I remember one round my neck for school with like dinner. You know, I'm already thinking about this little, <laughs> le little leather thing. And I was so excited. It, my parents got it from Spain. It had a C on it, you know, in metal, you know, like, oh. it's probably somewhere in the attic, but you know, like this yes. thing that was going to, it'd been tied loads of times because it kept snapping. But yeah, so I can understand that connection. And, and the red straight away is like, and the heart, you know, it's very yeah. symbolic of everything, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, the poem would write I, itself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that if you did something like that, it's kind of that's dealt with. You know, it's not an um. Yeah, it's not thing. thing yeah. Well, you 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 haven't physically got it, but you've remembered it. You, you. Yeah. You yeah. got more questions, Amy? Yeah, I'm just I'm just going through. I mean, the the story about your dolls, Hannah. I'd never heard that before. So that. Mm piece of information that oh you just your heart goes out oh. and, you know to travel with sets of clothing as well that were yours and then you know that you could change the dolls with and I yeah it's just it's just another aspect that I've never heard of or or spoken to anybody about you know these you know people talk about oh but I brought a doll over with me but then there's this added layer of of um meaning and symbolism behind that you know other people will briefly mention they brought the doll but then they kind of stopped there and you've added the extra detail which is absolutely endearing and, and you know to think what your parents were thinking at that moment to send you with not only the dolls but then you know look like little girls everywhere love to dress dolls up in in yeah. different outfits is is um an absolutely incredible story, really incredible. But actually, there's another thing that I didn't say that you just reminded me of. The clothes were made by my mother. Oh, don't, oh. You know, she was, um, I think she expressed her artistry in- In um, making for you. Sewing and knitting. And so there were these knitted and sewn dolls clothes wow and i met a man um, who um he was i think about 11 i mentioned him in the book and um he was 11 when i was born and he lived across the road and he told me that his mother used to go to my mother for sewing lessons. Mm. Yeah. Willie Croft. Yeah. Wow. So it's interesting that, you know, there is an artistic um, gene in the family then, you know, your mom with, with um, textiles and you with your writing it's really interesting in terms of how creativity comes out it's really really and so and such a loving thing as well you know to have the, you know the fact that your mom made these clothes is another added um aspect that we don't these like nuances that we're learning every day we just don't get these in history books and i think these are the personal incredible stories that need to be told and they just bring the story so much closer to the heart and to connect with people. Yeah. And they, they, these people are real. They mm. really live. 
Absolutely, absolutely. It was like when I said to Amy that, uh, you know, the lady that was telling me about this handkerchief and I was like, mm. oh, don't just let it be a bought handkerchief. And when she sent me the picture and I could see, and Bill, uh, you know, interpreted the message, you know, made with friendship. Oh my God, you know, it's exactly, you know, I have not connected, but the same feeling. And when I sent her the collage, she said, oh, she just cried, but in good way, you know, that I'd done mm -hmm. the collage for her. And, and, and that was, the handkerchief was her mother's experience, you know, that was that how they were mother, you know. I just couldn't have wished for anything better to be seen and the stitching and a little bit of staining. And, and she said the initials mm -hmm. were there, but they couldn't remember what the friend was called, but, and a sense of place, because the name of where the, the horrible place where they had to be was on it as well, you know, so it's also like not proof but I don't know I'm trying I don't know I'm struggling for words now because I'm only just thinking about it but connects on a practical physical level as well as you know emotional yeah. I think yes yes it brings it out of the mind into the, the real yeah yeah but I could still feel your purse even though you haven't got